Hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. This is episode number 182, coming at you live and direct from Stratford. As you can hear from the noise from that window over there, the trains are rushing by, the cars are speeding. It's another work week. We're back. We're off the Easter weekend. How the hell are you doing? Mother effers. Hope you guys are well rested, well hydrated, or well, you should be well rested. Anyway, you've been off since probably Thursday. And for those of you working service industry jobs, don't be uh, uh, don't be pissed off or angry. You've also been earning double pay this whole time you've been working. Hopefully you have. Yeah, hopefully you have good bosses and they don't, you know, try and work you underneath un, un, into the ground by not paying you um, time and a half or something. But hopefully most of you have been getting time and a half. Or if you have not been, then I hope some of you working service industry jobs have done the thing that I used to do where you kind of spec out your bank holiday days and you conveniently, you know, have a holiday, conveniently have some trip. And if you're just, if you're really smart, what you do is you pick up a hobby like running, right? And then you dedicate yourself to like running a race every weekend or every other weekend. So effectively you have to then have a day off from work, right? Which is fucking amazing because then all your colleagues will be happy for you because you're losing weight and you're looking good. Your, you know, your boss is going to be happy for you too because you're, because you're working out. You're probably focusing more when you're at work. Loads of weird things happen. Loads of taxes that you can do. But regardless of that, even if you're working all the way through until today, hope you guys are well, hope you guys are good. And I'm pretty good too, thank you for asking. Um, I've had a pretty up and down weekend, a pretty turbulent weekend, personally, I'd say. Um, lost a couple of my personal possessions, as per usual, when it gets a bit crazy on the outside. And you know when you, you had those kind of occasions where, you know, you lose some personal possessions, let's call it a wallet, right? <laughs> um, it's, it really gets you, um, you it, it really gets you, uh, how do I say you start to focus in on what really matters, you know? Like, what really matters? What are you trying to achieve? And I guess this weekend's been one of those kind of clear reminders of just what needs to be done. And I think sometimes as well, not even not even to get, like, um, really overly analytical about this or philosophical or, you know, to pull out analogies for out of my ass or to make connections out of things that don't make sense. But there is part of me that kind of sees, you know, whenever I look at Manchester United and I see how shit we do, right? And I see how poor we play and I see how badly organised our club is. It really gets me to thinking, like, just how, you know... I remember when I was younger, um, maybe because I grew up in a very conservative um, African household, right? But I remember when I was younger, one of the things that really upset me a lot when I was a small kid was the fact that um, my parents were like um, adamant, right? They were adamant, adamant. My parents were adamant, adamant that they were always right, right? You could never, they could never make a bad, they could never make a mistake. They would never say sorry for something. If they did, they'd always say it in a really like, you know, I don't know. You know, like, you know when people say sorry in a kind of way like, um, oh, I'm sorry if it hurt you or something like that, right? Like those kind of like backhanded um, apologies, right? So it never came from a very honest place. So when I growing up, I never really had the idea. In my head, I would, I don't know, I always had kind of a weird idea that you, adults especially were always just right, yeah? That kids were just kind of, you know, didn't know what they were talking about, or maybe in their feelings, whatever it may be called. Then the older you get and the more you start to realize that your parents are just human, just like you, right? You start to like, you know, they're not, they're not, um, they don't occupy that pedestal that they used to when you were a kid. Maybe because, you know, you start to become a bit self-sufficient. You start to grow up. You maybe get more, you start to build more friendships with other people. You maybe get into a relationship. You start to build other connections. With those connections, you start talking about your life and your story. And you start to realize that, oh, everyone's got a version of my story, right? Because sometimes when you grow up, you have the weird idea that somehow whatever you're going through is the worst thing you're going through and only you are going through it right you're like, oh my god if only i was like if only my parents were like my friend's parents right and i'm sure i'm sure it's, i know this sounds horrible but i'm sure a lot of people have done this before when you're a kid especially when your parents don't let you go out a, a lot or they don't give you much spending money or pocket money there's, there's sometimes you could always sort of think to yourself man i wish my parents were a little bit more like dan's parents or like laura's parents or whatever maybe right but then the older you get, you start to realize that every family has their issues, right? Every every kid has something that their parents do that ticks them off. And then one thing I start to realize when I get older, especially when I started going to college or started going to sixth form or university, or maybe called um, whatever stage that uni- education is, especially especially post primary school, you start to realize, especially with your with your teachers anyway, um, that you know adults aren't always right. They make a lot of mistakes, as do children, as do anyone else in the world, right? And you start to realize that just because the person's older than you doesn't mean they necessarily know more than you. It's just one of those things, right? You just don't. But again, when you're when you're a kid, you don't necessarily expect that. 
I guess sometimes there, there will be a stage when you're 16 when you're like, oh man, fuck off, dad. I can do I can do things on my own. I can live my own life, right? There is maybe that little bit of an infantile stage, but it's a bit of it's, it's usually posturing. You don't really believe it, right? You run away from home, but you don't really believe you're gonna survive, right? You know, you you know, there's always that kind of you know the button you can press to go back home. You know, that's not gonna be something you can do in the long term. But overall, I feel like I realized the older I got, oh, my parents aren't always right, and sometimes you know, uh, do it, kind of figuring things, figuring figuring that life for myself, even if I do get it wrong, because my parents are sometimes very, they were very um, quick to remind me of just how wrong I got it, and I'm sure, you know, most parents do that, not because they're being mean, but because, you know, they're just being loving, and they don't want their kids to hurt, so I get it, but sometimes, you know, in life, you really do want to make your own mistakes, and no, I did, I was desperate to make my own mistakes, I was desperate to get out of my own, to get out of my parents' house, I was desperate to go out there and just, just fucking fail, I wanted to fail so badly, that it was just, it was insane how much I wanted to fail. I wanted to just get out into the world and experience life because I knew for sure whatever I was experiencing at home wasn't it. It wasn't, it wasn't giving me any sort of life. I wasn't feeling any kind of, um, uh, how to describe it? I just wasn't feeling that the way I thought I was going to feel. And I guess one of the main things was like, no, my trip to Nicaragua, right? When I went to Nicaragua away to go visit my mate there when she was living there for a bit and to have a bit of a holiday. When I, and especially, you know, d- doing a trip to South America and then coming back home. I think if you live with your with your friends anyway, with flatmates, and you do that, it's one thing. But coming back home and living like that, you think to yourself, "Wow, wow, 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 wow. Um, I can't do this anymore, right?" So I kind of had that feeling, and then over over time, that subsided. Um, and I started to realize, you know what? I just need to make a change. Instead of moaning and you know biting heads of my parents and arguing, I just need to make a change. And anyway, going back to the Man United thing, I guess looking at Manchester United and looking at you know, especially I, I've supported Man United since '95, and you know during the heydays of Alex Ferguson's reign and you know cups of the cups of the cup the challenge of Arsenal Wenger came along we roast that challenge still kept winning stuff the challenge of Roman Abramovich came along we roast that challenge we still kept winning stuff and I've just always kind of been in that kind of um I've always been spoiled in the idea that Manchester United have always kind of figured out a way to raise to the challenge that other teams have kind of you know put that you know put their kind of flag in the ground and said hey this is the new level this is, this is the point you have to run to and we've always kind of met it but in recent years, since since Alex Ferguson's retired, it just seems like we just haven't been able to figure out what needs to be done in order for us to return back to where we were previously. Now, it's not necessarily a case of it's not. I don't think it's as bad as what's happened to Arsenal. It's not probably as bad as what happened to Liverpool because I think by and large, I think Liverpool's run was just so impressive, was just so little with trophies that they could have been a little bit of negligence, you know, a little bit of a uh, carelessness. Um, there wasn't maybe the same impetus in terms of winning stuff that there was before because you know they've won so many, they've won so many championships prior, right? Which probably goes, which is probably why even though clubs like Real Madrid and Chelsea are annoying as fuck, um, especially in Real Madrid's case, right? They just you know they have all the money in the world, they they have the prestige. So essentially, they can go around and cherry pick all the best players in the world with no with no real rhyme or reason as to where how they're gonna play, right? And it's kind of catching up with them, which is why they kind of decided to get back to Zidane. So they can't necessarily keep do keep um, copying that model because you know, especially you know, especially when you're if you think to yourself like, where are the next Messi's and Ronaldo's gonna come from? They can't necessarily keep relying on buying those players because you know, those players aren't necessarily always going to be one to come to Real Madrid, especially not that early in their career. Blah 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 blah. But it seems like in 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 recent times, United just have failed. We just I don't know. United just we just failed to kind of raise their challenge, and it and it kind of always kind of reminds me of my life, and it kind of makes me think, oh, okay, if United can't figure this out, right, and they have professionals from all all walks of life, they have experts from various different industries, they have an unlimited amount of money in order to kind of hire the best people, um, they have the benefit of so much. Uh, public feedback right they, they can, all they need to do is go on twitter again maybe it's not the best idea if you're running a big company like um, uh, Manchester United or a corporation or a football club like united that probably isn't the best idea to go read twitter comments but they've got so much um information that they can tap into for free right that's, that's in the urethra that's out there in a the solar system that they can just tap into and pull into the club that it really makes you think how are they not able to do this because i think to myself especially in my life i think if I was, if I had a group of friends around me, who were all pushing and striving to be the best in what they do, to sacrifice going out, to sacrifice distractions, to sacrifice drugs, alcohol, to sacrifice um, leisurely indulgence, to really commit to being the best, right? Because I think I've been listening to a lot of recent um, podcasts with various different people, and I guess maybe just now because of you know. 
um, the fact that I lost my thing, my wallet during the warehouse party the other week, the other day of the weekend, it got me just thinking. I think it kind of hit home a lot with me over the over the weekend, just thinking, you know what. I need to make a change, right? I need to, if I want to be the best, I always say I've had these, I, I always say to myself, I've got these really heady aspirations where I want to do amazing work. I really want to go for things. I really want to change my life. I really want to change the course of my life. I can't keep doing the same things I'm doing now. I have to do something differently. And I just think, I just think um, there's no time to waste, man. There just is no time to waste, right? There's just time keeps going on. The moment I stand still, the moment I just faff around, time just keeps going on, right? And I think United have finally started to realise that, where I think, um, where a lot of United fans are sort of like sitting there thinking, oh, fuck, man, this is going to be so difficult, blah, blah, blah. I'm looking at it and I'm quite, and I'm really worried because it's like, time keeps moving on. So, what, however long it takes United to figure out what they're going to do next, it's no guarantee that, It's no guarantee that other clubs are just not going to keep going on as well, right? Like, that's the thing that's worrying. Like, you, Man City have kind of reached their... Are, are into a bit of a groove now. You have the feeling that if Man City decide to let go of Pep Guardiola, Pep Guardiola decides to leave Man City, that they have a succession line in plan. They have a plan in place of who to who they're going to hire next as a coach, right? I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised if they go out and get someone like Bielsa in, right? Who's kind of plays the same sort of football. But you know they've got a plan in place of who comes in next. Arsenal have kind of tasted what it means, what it means to have a manager like a Una Emery, a serial winner, someone that actually has won things, somebody that's very strict, uh, somebody that expects the best from their players, somebody that's always trying to, you know, um, exceed past results, right? Someone that isn't comfortable, isn't relaxed, or isn't kind of um, happy with just, you know, getting top four as maybe Wenger was maybe in the past. You've got Pochettino too, if he decides to leave Tottenham. Tottenham have also got a taste of what it means to have a really top class manager. Uh, managing a club at Tottenham with limited resources, so they're, they're obviously going to go get another top, a top um, manager to replace him. Then you've got Liverpool, who have also tasted what it means to have a top level manager who can play the style of football that, that they like, high intensity, cares about the club. If he decides to leave, or if they sack him, there's a section plan in place. And if they win a league this season, what that will do to their overall psyche of knowing that they're fucking champions and the best team in the league. What's that going to do to them? Knowing that they they done they became the best team in the league with, with a James Milner, with uh, Jordan Henson in their team. Imagine if they replaced those guys with like, quote-unquote, worldies. So that's the worrying thing for you, Man United fan. Not the fact that Man United are taking so long to figure out what needs to be done. And it doesn't seem to be any kind of improvement in the overall structure and overall approach. The worrying thing that is that everyone else is figuring out what they want to do. And they're, they're, co they're just like moseying on down. That train is just chugging along whilst we're trying to figure out what will to change. What what cabin is fucked up? Is it the track? We're still trying to figure that out and they're chugging away. But everyone's like, oh no, don't worry, man. You know, they're great, man. They've got one of the best trains in the world. They've got one of the best. It's like, yeah, and? Dynasties have failed for less, man. Look at Real Madrid. Look at AC Milan and Inter Milan. Two huge clubs in Italy. Who don't come anywhere near winning the Serie A anymore. I don't know, man. Um, I'm worried. But talking about that, I might as well talk about United v Everton. Um, a very puzzling. I wouldn't say puzzling. A very puzzling game in the in the in the, in the fact that you thought we were going to have a bit of a response, right? You thought the players were going to go out there and try to um, um, do themselves justice. You thought we were going to see something a bit different. Um, you thought all these things, and then once it happened, once once the, once the game actually evolved uh, quickly, we started to realize that nope, that wasn't the case. Um, so yeah, um, United played Everton the other day, and unfortunately, um, we lost four nil um, away from home to an Everton side that most people would wouldn't regard as good. To an Everton side the prior week who lost to Fulham. 1-0, right? A uh, club that's already going to get relegated. So it kind of really just, it really did throw me off, to be honest. I didn't really expect that level of performance. Um, the team, I, I would say, wasn't that bad. I don't think the team was as bad as people are making out. I think considering what we had available and considering the opposition, I think that was probably our best strength side. Um, we had Lindelof playing at right back for some reason. We had Chris Smalling and Jones at centre-back and the lower left-back. 
which is a bit worrying um, considering the team that we were playing. I think it would have been probably beneficial just to play Damian at right back or to get a kid in to cover the left flank. I just think there is under no circle, or maybe the whole point was to have those three at the back, has three centre backs, and then have the f and then have kind of the low out on the left in the midfield four, and then probably kind of pushing up maybe. Um, but regardless, it didn't work. And I guess I, w I would like to start this off by saying, you know, again, it's no individual player's fault because I think some of these players are only there because of mismanagement of our club. I think prior managers, um, I think the owner, I think Ed Woodward, who's kind of been, I don't know how he's gotten away with just, um, he's just been immune from any kind of um, threat to his job. He's still there making decisions, signing, um, giving people contracts, um, giving the manager a contract, announcing new punching deals. That doesn't make any sense because he's been essentially at the helm and uh, and kind of ushered in free failed managers. And he still seems to be, um, kept, um, in a, he still seems to have kept his job, even though he's failed in his recruitment of managers there. That's another topic for another day. But it's no individual players' fault. I think the players are only doing as best as they can do with the ability that they're given. Um, and considering the just the overabundance of averageness we have in that team, it's just very hard to uh, to play well when you've got those kind of players playing for you, right? Essentially, I look at that back four. And I say to myself, you could probably have a, an argument to replace every single one of them, including Lindelof and Delo, who probably are the most promising, probably have the most... Um, you probably have the most potential in order to kind of make it um, in in their United career and then go on to win big trophies. But even those two players probably could be on the bench. You could probably have a senior player in front of them, pushing them uh, uh, to be better, right? And then when they come on a the sub, they try to do better. They try to play against injured. They want to improve. They want to have their name on the team sheet. You could probably have an argument that two of the midfield three shouldn't be anywhere near the starting lineup. Matic because he's too old and too slow, and Fred because he's still probably trying. He's, he's still uh, getting acclimatized to playing in the Premier League, and we still haven't seen the best of him. Then up front, you got three strikers who, on their day, could be world beaters, but right about now are suffering. Rashford probably because he's still got a knock and an injury. Lukaku because. This probably isn't. This probably is a level above what he can do, right? It's probably not where he needs to be. And I think, in general, outside of that, the team isn't necessarily built around his strengths. Um, we don't necessarily uh, feed balls in through the channels, clip balls over the top, um, transition very quickly in order for him to run on and to finish. I think that's where he kind of is his strengths. I think even though he looks like a big, aggressive, burly striker in the mold of a Drogba, in the mold of a Duncan Ferguson in the mold of uh, whatever, um, in a Dean Ashton, whatever he may be called, right? He's not that player. He's more he's more similar to a Chikorita, to a Michael Owen, uh, to a James Vardy, than he is to any of those players I mentioned previously. He plays better on the shoulder defender. Last shoulder defender, running onto balls with little to no time to think about things, just instinctual. That's why he delivers the best um, um, options for you. The moment you try to get him involved in the build-up play and have him um, take the ball in deep and spread out wide and run into the box, the same level, same way that maybe a Harry Kane does it for Tottenham, is where you maybe see him uh, falter and kind of really, really um, suffer when he plays for us. Um, and then, of course, he has the reputation of not being able to do it against a big club. So cool. Then you've got a Martial who's... Um, um, Epically inconsistent, right? Never seems to be able to maintain a level of performance that gives you any kind of hope that he's going to be a world beater because he has all the ability to be a world beater. Yeah, he's got he's got ice cold finishing in front of goal. He's dribbling with the ball at his feet is incredible. He can run at pace really, really well. He's incredibly direct, um, but he just doesn't seem to be inconsistent enough. And I'm not sure what it is. I'm not sure if it's because, you know, back in the day when Ibrahimovic was here, he got stripped of the number nine and that kind of never really sat well with him at that time. Then he kind of got pushed out wide and maybe he always sees himself as a, maybe a main striker. I don't know what the deal was, but he's never really um, replicated um, the heady heights of his first season when he played underneath Ang Van Gaal, right? Cool, no worries. But that team should be probably enough to beat this Everton side, right? It probably should be enough to beat the Everton side considering the players that they got out there. But unfortunately, most football nowadays, unfortunately, or, or for, unfortunately for us, isn't that isn't dictated by individual players it's mostly dictated by the strength of your overall team and Everton came out with a clear game plan they were they came out to pressurize our defense uh to put pressure especially on the back four who are incredibly shy on the ball and effectively made them crumble um they pushed back our midfield our midfield was able to get on the ball our strikers were isolated up top and then eventually they got a couple of chances or maybe three or four three no two chances first of all and they scored from the first two chances they got and then from then on, we were chasing the game. The more we chased it, more space opened up and the game ended up 4-0. 
Now, I think overall, the um, impression that I got on this performance was that it feels as if some of the players who have kind of performed for Solskjaer in the first three months when he started have suddenly sort of like realised what level they're at. I think a lot of us United fans were very aware that the three, the three months that we had with Solskjaer were a bit of a fluke. They weren't necessarily um, indicative of the level the players are actually at. I think now we always knew the players were shit. We knew that it wasn't always Mourinho's fault. It wasn't because Mourinho was making them feel sad or playing rubbish. It was because they're rubbish, right? And I think Mourinho's comments that even though they were a bit rude and they were a bit disrespectful to the players that were playing, his comments that um, it was a great achievement to finish second with that team is incredibly true, right? Considering the level of players that Man City have, considering how good Klopp has Liverpool playing, considering how consistent Pochettino has Tottenham playing, it was a credible result for us, that United team, to finish second, especially to get especially considering the levels at which some of the players were playing and just the overall lack of talent in and ability and special and speciality, specialized, whatever it may be called, in a team, right? You look at our fullback, for instance, right? We've got there's no specialist, right? Backup, right? Back you remember Mourinho back in Chelsea, like two World Class players for every position? We don't have that. We don't have a like for like sub replacement for sure when he's not around. We don't have a like for like replacement for Dalo even or a senior player in front of him that can challenge him. None. Center backs. With they get both get injured, what happens then? You play Matic and center back. You, you know what I mean? It's just, it's one of the most bizarre things I've seen in a long time where a club of United stature is incapable of building a squad that can challenge, not win, that can challenge for top honors, that can actually mount a credible threat that teams are scared of, um, that other teams, you know, a, a team full of players other teams want. Like, you know, apart from David De Gea, what, who wants any of our players? Like for real, who they who would they buy? A Paul Pogba, really? Are you sure? Do you want that influence in your dressing room? Do you want all the distraction of his social media team? Do you want all of that? Do you want all the dancing? Do you want all of this entertainment? Probably not. So we're in a very very precarious state at the moment. Um, I think this is probably the most important next few months for United in terms of what we do next. The story I've heard earlier on about um, supposedly Mike Phelan being given a football director's role is incredibly worrying. Um, I think for any United fan out there, I think you should be worried if they're looking at Mike Phelan to be the football director of our club, considering the lack of direction we've had in the in the in the years prior to that. It probably seems like a little bit of an emotional, reactional, um, panic decision to make. I think Mike Phelan getting given a job maybe a few years down the line. Once we've kind of got our, set ourselves settled, once the actual professional with experience has come in and done that job and kind of laid some foundation, might make some more sense. But hiring Mike Feeder now just makes absolutely no sense. It's just more cutting corners, more maybe saving money on salary, more of a more of a decision to get somebody that can maybe be a bit of a yes man in that respect. Not in terms of I don't think I don't think Mike Feeder is a yes man, but getting those kind of people involved in the club who are kind of familiar, who've been there from the beginning of this kind of transition probably a bit more favourable to Ed Woodward's position than it is maybe getting somebody else completely outside of the club who might ice Ed Woodward out of the discussions and, and whatever it may be for the club. And I just think in general, there's there's going to be a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, a lot of honest kind of, a lot of really brutal and ruthless work needs to be done, like in terms of the players that we need to get rid of. Like, I think I've agreed with a couple of other commentators. It's not necessarily who we buy, it's who we get rid of. I think we've always had that kind of problem at United. We never seem to be getting rid of our shit players. They always seem to just hang around like a bad smell. Um, Fellaini is probably one of the best examples of that. You know, he stays at our club. He stays at our club ahead of us. A player like Daily Blind, who's now playing in the Champions League final. I mean, um, sorry, um, Champions League semi final um, for Ajax, right? A player who was an incredible footballer, a player who kind of could play numerous positions. Who probably would have been able to help us out a lot more than Fellaini had done in the past. Um, so a lot of weird decisions have been made over the years that I don't currently necessarily agree with. And I think, um, I don't know, man. I'm just hoping that they make the right choice. But the things, the rumblings that you've been hearing so far from the team and from what, um, I mean, from the club in general, doesn't give me any kind of hope, really, um, that they're going to do the right thing. It just doesn't give me any hope. I don't think it's going to happen. Especially when you start, you start when you start thinking about Mike Fiedler as being a football director, when you give Ole Gunners the job, you know, ahead of the the end of the season without really kind of being ruthless and thinking about what the club really needs going forward, I think you'll be probably setting us up for failure. I'd love to be proven wrong. I hope I am being proven wrong, but I just can't see um how this is going to get better with the current 
um, administration or the current ownership at the helm. I just hope Steve would get better. Because if Ed Woodward still thinks he can keep his job and he, do, he doesn't feel like his job should, it should be at any kind of threat, even though he's he's kind of, you know, ushered in three failed managers since I suppose he's retired, I think we've got a big issue there. That's the issue that I've got here. And if we're given to player power, if we're incapable of seeing what is actually happening in the world of football, with football directors, with sporting directors, with people that can kind of steer the ship at the top and then kind of implement coaches that can kind of, you know, um, cultivate or develop a style of play. If we're not necessarily seeing what the benefits of that are, then we're really, really lost. But again, it's, I'm, I don't want to be too bummed out about it. I'm hoping we have a reaction against City tomorrow in, in the league, but I doubt it. I'm not sure why people are so confident we're going to go there and pull, um, um, and pull out a result from, from our asses. It's not going to be possible. So, City are trying to win the league. I don't know what we're trying to do. I don't think some of the players even want to try and get in the top four. Um, I don't know. You know what I mean? I don't think it's going to happen personally. We're, going to, we're probably going to get spanked by Man City. And that will probably be... That will, pro- that will probably be... It will probably serve us better to get spanked by Man City than it will be to win 5-0. You know? Just because I think our club is so short-sighted that somehow they're going to look at that result and think, oh yeah, see, no, there's nothing wrong. In the same way how the first three months, because we kept winning, we had that massive, we had that long unbeaten run. They kept seeing it as if nothing was wrong that was going on right now. And I just don't think that's right. Um, I don't think that's right. I, think, I, don't, I don't think we're in a position by chance. I think we got here because of mismanagement and we're going to continue to be here through mismanagement. But again, what do I know? Anyway, uh, moving on up, moving on in. That's kind of bumming me out here. Um, what else I wanted to talk about today? Let's take this off here. Let's get on there. Bah, 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 bah. Okay, what else I want to talk about here? Let's get the screen up. Oh, Kanye Coachella. Did anyone see that performance? There's a little, there's a little TMZ, TMZ um, slideshow that I wanted to show you guys. I'll show the thing a bit big. But yeah, um, so Kanye West performed at Coachella on Sunday for a thing called Sunday Service. Um, um, uh, 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 this is probably tying into the Sunday service that they, they've been doing in Calabasas, I think, or Calabasas, um, or whatever they live in California. They've been doing it recently where every Sunday they all kind of gather around. Kanye hires loads of musicians uh, to come and play, um, loads of gospel singers, a choir, um, and they essentially come and sing. They essentially go and sing. I, I'm, I'm assuming it's, at, it's, it's the land that he was roaming around it, roaming around with uh, Charlemagne that time. Do you remember when they were walking around the hills and he was saying that oh, he wants to build schools with sort of shit? I think that's the I think that's the place where they did the Sunday serve the Sunday service. I'm pretty sure it might be because I remember hearing Brendan Shaw say he jogs around those place those hills when he's um um you know when he's at home he jogs around those places and he's always kind of hearing the sound blurring out as he's jogging. Uh, so I think it tied in with that and obviously it's a great way for Kanye West to kind of experiment to kind of go out of his kind of artistic um, moniker you know underneath Kids He Goes with Kid Cudi he's able to you know uh, be in a duo and again kind of you know change the kind of music he's putting out there and underneath Sunday Service he's kind of you know he's part of a bigger uh, group conglomerate right he doesn't necessarily need to be the only one in the front of the camera so it happened in Coachella everyone was really hyped about it we didn't really get any details about what was going to happen but we saw loads of images of of how they were going to set up and stuff. And it looked, it looked fucking incredible, right? In terms of the setup and everything that they do. And you know for sure, Kanye is one thing, he's talented, really, really um, second level. Um, n- another level at doing is a s- stage design, set design, right? He's, um, those immersive worlds that he creates around his albums are just, you know, they're second to none, really. From the life of Pablo to Jesus to everything else in between, he just knows what he's doing in that regard. So that was something that wasn't going to be surprising. But seeing the pictures and seeing how it kind of unfolded in IRL was interesting because number one, we got it all filmed through like a uh, a fisheye lens camera or a peephole camera, whatever it may be called. Something, uh, the kind of same camera you would maybe see if you're using like a super, is it Super 8 or Super 90, whatever that camera is, right? Um, the kind of one you hold in your hand, the ones that they kind of use sometimes in uh, Stranger Things, I think, right? And it kind of reminded me of old, um, it's going to be weird to say this, but it's gonna, it kind of reminded me of old cult, cult videos, like footage that you'd see, you know, from like, um, do you remember that documentary? Um... What's it called? Um, Wild Wild Country on Netflix, right? Um, it kind of reminded me of that sort of footage. So super grainy, through a peephole, done a certain way, um, in capture that kind of event. And obviously, it kind of it kind of made sense that that happened that way because um, they then hired loads of photographers to come and work for them or to kind of do the photography from like Jim Joe to Liam McRae, who are you all using film cameras or using their phone with film apps on it. So that was kind of the immediate approach that they wanted to do. 
and you kind of got that feel from it. So it's kind of weird to watch considering most of the live streams on Coachella were filmed, you know, wide angle, um, very clear, super HD, amazing quality. And then you got this complete opposite where it was bit, a little bit more um, constrained, but it also kind of forced you to pay attention. You couldn't kind of take your eyes off of it, which is maybe kind of part of the reason why they did it in the first place. But essentially, it was a very, a very, very interesting show. Um, all the performers were standing up on a mount, um, kind of, you know, like just standing still, like in the same vein or same fashion that you would see maybe a Kanye West show, at, um, a Kanye West fashion show in that regard. Um, and part of me was a bit nervous, thinking, "Oh man, he's gonna, he's gonna, like, he's gonna, he's got these gospel singers standing on this um, man-made mount. I think that they made basically. They kind of imported in loads of fucking mud and sand and built this amazing little hill thing. He's got all these gospel singers standing there wearing heavy, heavy, heavy cotton twill kind of t-shirts and shit um, in the baking heat of LA sun, right? During Coachella, I don't even want to like faint again. In the same way that happened to Andrea and that New York Jesus show." So I was getting a bit nervous about that, but obviously it didn't seem as cold. It didn't seem as hot, or um, I guess maybe the clothing was um, cool enough for the um, gospel singers to wear where they didn't faint. Then they stood around for a few minutes. No, let's say a few, maybe more than twenty minutes, like not doing anything. Um, Omnibus kind of uh, sound kind of played through the organ, I think, or something else. I don't know what was what else was playing in the background. And suddenly they kind of broke into some sort of hymns. And it kind of went on singing the kind of churches for, I don't know, maybe a good 30 minutes until maybe Kanye West decided to come out and decide to rapping and doing his kind of sampling on the uh, on the MIDI keyboard. So it was a it was kind of an amalgamation of um, loads of gospel singing. Uh, there was a guy or I'm not sure if it was a guy or a girl on stage who was kind of doing the whole like gospel preaching sort of thing. Uh, praying and whatever. And it looked quite mesmerizing, to be honest. So again, I was quite on the fence about the whole thing, but... It did look quite mesmerizing throughout the whole performance to see um, people gathered around Coachella, essentially going to church on a Sunday, right? Yeah, at the end of Coachella, through all their debauchery, through all their fucking excess and all that sort of stuff, they all gathered around and kind of celebrated in yellow sun and praise the Lord or whatever they believe in. And um, TMZ has some really cool pictures, actually, that they got just put up now. I think I'm, I'm sure the Kanye's team kind of basically sent it to them. So Jim Jones, Liam Le- Le- McRae were responsible for most of the photography. And some of the pictures do look quite incredible, to be fair, um, considering um, um, how everyone was on the fence regarding the overall performance in the first place. But these pictures do look really, really, really good. I'm going to get them up here so you guys can see. Um, it's on TMZ. I'll link in the show notes for those of you listening to the podcast. But they're really cool pictures. Um, so the first picture here we got is of Kanye West uh, crying in the arms, uh, surrounded by his friends, uh, most notably Kitty Cuddy. Kitty Cuddy. <laughs> um, this was during. It just. It just was. I think this might be during Jesus Walks or something, right? I forgot what it was with. Where he, he kind of broke down and started crying. Well, what else? As the song was thing, and I think Kanye's been a bit emotional lately. He's been crying a lot, isn't it? When stuff has been happening, um, maybe it's it's kind of due to the uproar and the backlash that he got from supporting Trump and stuff, but it seems if he's in a very emotional emotional and vulnerable place nowadays and I think his friends are kind of aware of that, um, which probably goes back which probably says a lot of why you don't really hear people speaking ill or bad of Kanye in public as of late. People have kind of backed off from it. So I think maybe people have realized that no, he's actually going through a really difficult time at the moment. So he needs all the love and support that he can get. Blah 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 blah. I don't know. Probably that's the case, right? Um that's one picture. Then you've got um then you got here a picture of I think Kanye with his one of his daughters. I think that might be North there. Um chilling out again. Great. Um I love how he, what he did with his hair dye, he kind of, you know, loads of purple hues in it, tie dye all over his head. You got Tiana Taylor dancing on top of something here with her amazing braids. It looked really Tiana Taylor looked fucking awesome. She had like a kind of what, a long sleeve bikini thing on with the side of her thing showing and the trousers kind of slung low. It looked incredible. She looked awesome. She looked fucking awesome. Um really cool outfit but again when does Tiana Taylor not look good in clothes um here's Kanye kind of kneeling as they're performing as well just kind of meditating to himself I really like the t-shirt really the the cut of the t-shirt is awesome isn't it it's a it's incredibly oversized like the shoulders the shoulders come down the shoulder point what well, the shoulder seam comes down maybe past he's just just above the elbow it's incredibly long <laughs> um shirt but it does look really good it fits him amazing um again a really cool comfortable maybe shirt to wear during those kind of performances um you got chance the rapper who fucking smoked his performance man he really you could tell he was super amped to be performing essentially at church in public in front of people with Kanye West's kind of you know main guy so that was fucking awesome to see um 
Kanye West again with Mike Dean to the side. I love Kanye West's uh, cargo pants. He's been do- he's making a lot of these, but we they haven't really they haven't released as of yet. Um, hopefully they come out soon. But those cargo pants that he makes are fucking awesome, man. Hopefully he releases more coming soon in the future. But they look really cool. Uh, doing his thing there. Um, what else you got? This is another picture of maybe Chance. I think with the microphone in his hand, taken by Jim Jones. An awesome picture. A picture of somebody from the gospel choir with a headset on. Another picture here from the up down looking up. That looks fucking cool. We've got a picture here with um, two chains surrounded by people in the choir as well, hanging out. Loads of names that we'll probably mention. I think might be two changes. A wife there on the side too. Um, you've got Kid Cudi and Willow Smith. I mean, and Jaden Smith, sorry. Um, another picture here again. You've got the kids dancing, having a good time. Kid Cudi with the chains on. Got a picture of Chance the Rapper with his wife and children. Another picture of Kanye West and the tie-dye um, prints all over his um, head. A picture of 07, 07 Shake who was there, um, just kind of absorbing it all, being in the moment and just kind of standing there stoically. That was quite cool to see. Another picture of Kid Cudi and Mike Dean. A picture of Travis Scott and um, Kylie Jenner. The family were there. L- Lala Anthony and Kim Kardashian there, hugging and embracing. A picture of another the team of the gospel choir again, running down the hill, having a good time. Kanye on the keys. Smiling, brimming, the choir again singing hallelujah. DMX did an amazing prayer during the service too. That was incredibly powerful and very DMX-like. Um, that was cool to see. It was just a shame that he just turned up in his own clothes. He didn't care about what they were wearing. He just turned up, he just wore his own shit. That was funny. Um, again, Kim Kardashian. I don't, I'm not sure what those sticks are that she's got on the side of her arm. Are they, are they crutches? What's wrong with her legs? Can she not walk or something? I don't know. That's Kim there. I don't know what's happening there. But yeah, that's her. Uh, with North again. Let's get this. Yeah, the angles probably messed up there. But anyway, continue. There's Chance the Rapper again. Chilling. Kanye again on the keys. Good, good, good sight to see, right? I wonder if that's the, the original keyboard that you know that picture that he's got where he's on the keys. I don't know if his mum took it. It's a proposal picture where he's like, I wonder if that's one of the original that original keyboard from that picture. I'm not sure if it is. It might be. Who knows? Another cool picture of somebody reaching out into the heavens with the sun beaming down on them. More pictures again. More pictures of the crowd and the choir on the mount. And I think that is maybe the most important, impressive picture of them all, right? In terms of set design. So essentially, you've got this amazing stage that they've set out, right? This space where um, it sort of looks, I don't know, how old do you call it? Like a little bump, right? Around. Then the mound kind of rises up so that, I guess, so that everyone can see. Right, so from every angle of the crowd, you can see them performing on that hill because I guess because there's no screens that were showing the performances, they could only really see them from afar from that hill, and then they had security lining the entire perimeter of the base of that of that hill, so that all the VIPs could only stand on the bit that they were there, and then the performers at the top. So it was really fucking cool to see. Again, aerially, we didn't get many aerial views because again it was filmed through a people camera, but. I think these kind of pictures really kind of bring to light like how amazing this performance was and what it looked like and how kind of great it looked overall. And again, that just looks fucking incredible, doesn't it? You have to really be honest. Like, this picture's from Coachella, I guess, right? They took them from above, maybe from a drone. It does look fucking cool. And I guess, I don't know, my verdict on it is kind of skewed. Um, I think I'm happy for Kanye for the show and what happened and whatever and how it made him feel. And I guess maybe it's a way for him to connect again with the higher powers and for him to maybe have some direction in his life and that sort of stuff, especially from the turmoil he's gone through or since the whole um, Make America Great Again and Trump thing. But there is a part of me that's a little bit like, I don't know, like, should I now be caring about church because I'm a Kanye fan? Like, should that be um, my prerogative? Should I um, be following Kanye down the church path? Should I now be trying to go to church, uh, becoming more spiritually aware or awaken or that sort of stuff? And I think probably not. I don't necessarily care for that sort of stuff. And I think... There's a part of me that thinks it's a bit disingenuous. It's maybe coming from a place of trying to repay his reputation, which I'm sure he doesn't really care about as much as we think he does. But there is a part of me that probably thinks like, you know, his ego has to have taken a dent when he came out, jumped out and supported Trump and had the entirety of the hip hop community kind of like tell him to fuck off. Right. There must have been something that really hurt his ego. Um, And I guess the only thing that he's able to do or that people want to listen to him about is when he talks about fashion and is when he performs on the stage 
anything else, no one wants to hear him talk, right? And even the fashion thing, sometimes people get a little bit annoyed, right? Um, even with the church clothes, people are like saying, you know, the 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 church clothes that he's selling at this Coachella performance, I think they were like, you know, one hundred and seventy dollars for a jumper or some shit. That people are saying, oh, that's incredibly, you know, overpriced and. Um, it kind of you know it's a bit funny that you'd be doing a church service then trying to sell people these kind of things but I guess you know if you know what if you if you're familiar with anything Kanye makes you'll know that you know even the most basic of t-shirts they're always going to cost you sixty dollars plus right you'd never go into it making those kind of things you know any other way um let me let me try and see if I can get a video up of what he did here of the price of the of the thing but i know it was it was a lot more expensive people kind of assumed it would be right um i'm sure it was at over 170 dollars or something along those kind of lines let me see if i can find it uh fifty thousand people supposedly were there which was kind of incredible to see right that's what people are saying supposedly fifty thousand people but i'm not sure if that's actually correct because you know motherfuckers love to lie man what was the price of the there's a, was a merch there's a picture of the merch somewhere around here that someone put out uh where is it there's a video here of dmx doing the whole praying thing there's no way we can live for jesus when we're living in the flesh so i pray that you allow our spirits to be about that. But anyway dmx is praying there um some of the dancers dancing having a good time i think blackpink joined the minute as well so we get moshing and having a good time but yeah they did the damn thing it works for them i guess in some regard um i'm happy for them in that regard um and yeah congratulations to the whole entire family congratulations to kanye west and i guess for me i'm just i don't know i'm just not interested i just don't, i just don't care maybe because i'm I, i've got my own personal misgivings about church in general uh maybe because i'm just a bit tired of kanye west and i just don't care about what he has to say outside of the music and the fashion and stuff but i guess in, by saying that i also have to be admit that you know um we have to maybe accept that our artists are going to be a little bit crazy and we have to accept the good with the bad right if if he's able to give you great albums if he's able to design really cool stuff if he's able to give me yeezys and give me those cargo pants and the desert rat boots and shit and if i'm willing to uh, support that then i have to maybe um not i don't have to endorse or agree with what he has to say but i have to be you know i just have to kind of let it roll off my shoulders and not be bothered about it and be like you know what He's not he's not my hero anymore that he was maybe in the past. He's not someone I kind of look towards in terms of guidance, in terms of life and decision making, all that sort of stuff. It might be it probably was naive and ignorant of me to do that in the first place. There are probably far there's probably a uh, a far better population of people out there, far greater number of people who have probably dedicated their lives to enhancing the lives of others and providing materials that will enhance the life of others that I should be tapping into as opposed to Kanye West, right? That's probably um what i should be doing in that regard but anyway it was a good performance um if you want to check it out i think there's loads of clips on youtube people have put up and stuff so make sure you do check it out again the footage isn't the best um in terms of if you're looking towards the chctv stuff but i quite like how immersive it is i think it was a good way to kind of get people to kind of sit there and really pay attention i wasn't necessarily watching it but i had it in the background whilst i was on my phone and stuff and while i was doing other things so it kind of kept my attention in that regard i didn't want to close the window or mute it i always went to kind of hear what was going on just in case i heard a new song and yeah, that was basically it. Um, and Coachella ended. So probably a good way to end Coachella. I think everyone kind of had, I think this year was maybe one of their best years, I think. You had the rise of Billie Eilish. You had um, that band, Koi, Koi Graybin, I forgot what they called. The ones that do amazing covers. They performed really well. You had Virgil's DJ performance that everyone was hyped about. You had Nina Kravitz, um, new live audio visual experience. Um, you had Childish Cambino performing. You had tons and tons of people performing who really kind of smashed it this year. And I think the close of the festival with Sunday service is probably a bit of a genius move. If they keep this, if they keep doing this every year, that would be cool too. Um, just in terms of really kind of, I don't know, maybe giving Coachella a bit more of a spiritual vibe. It's not the most spiritual place ever, I'd assume. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't because I haven't been, but I wouldn't think it would be, right? It, it does seem a place where people just go to kind of clap chase and to kind of be in front of the camera and shit, um, which isn't a bad thing. But maybe including a little bit of spirituality, a little bit of reflection, a little bit of meditation might be a good thing for Coachella and going forward in general. Um, and it might kind of get people to kind of see the festival for being a little bit more than just a chance to clout chase. But who knows? um anyway what's next on the list let's move on from that because i'm bored talking about Kanye west um i'm sure people are bored about even hearing about him right i would assume 
um i don't know what's next here oh what's this you what mate oh yeah let's check this out um so really interesting video as you know i want to see if i can find this somewhere maybe it's, is the sound actually playing i'm here is the sound playing can people hear the sound of the computer hopefully you can hear it but i don't know if you can let me switch back let me go here and let me say there we go cool hello hello hello. Maybe you can hear the sound now right okay cool so this video really kind of got me interested and kind of went to speak about this topic um again i don't mean it to be disrespectful to anyone but just something that kind of really hits home to me considering considering i was one of these people back in the day right so this video I saw on BBC, um, in short, which is a pretty good little section um, of content that they put out there. It's not as um, clickbaity as the stuff you see on Daily Mail, but it still has that kind of element in it, you know, kind of stories that you're like, oh, what, really? How the fuck that happened? You kind of always click it. So it always kind of gets you to click. So I think they do a good job in that regard. They always get me to kind of click onto it and I always want to check it out. Anyway, these two young ladies um, are on this show called BBC in Sh BBC Five Live in short. It's a little clip that they've, no, I think the BBC Five Live. And this is the in short segment they've put on onto the internet. I'm assuming, and the headline reads: Plus size models running a 10k in underwear, right? Um, and I'm guessing it's, it's part of some message and the, and the subtext underneath here is uh, two plus size models have told BBC Radio Five Live that they are running a 10k race in their underwear to inspire body confidence. Um, Sharifa J and Jada Caesar. Cesar will be running the Vitality London 10K in May. Uh, the clip was taken from Emma Barnett program on Wednesday, the 17th of April, 2019. So these are two girls. This is what they're going to do. They're going to go out there and run to promote body positivity. Cool. All sounds good so far, right? I've not got really any problem with it. I think maybe now going forward, there should be a bit more of a movement in terms of promoting... Uh, I wouldn't say body positivity, body positivity is probably the right term for it, but I think it's been co-opted by very obese, like, like, you know, incredibly overweight people who are kind of co-opting that term and saying that the way they are is healthy and it's fine, which obviously it isn't. And we obviously have loads of science and data to back that up. But I think there is a portion of women, even men out there who are built a certain way, who have maybe a certain kind of, um, who are kind of come from a certain line of DNA um, in terms of their family and what they're, you know members of their extended family look like so they, there's only so there's only so much that you can kind of you know change your overall physiology uh the way they structure their body set whatever it may be their susceptibility to put on weight through eating certain types of food and other people don't you know we all have those kind of people in our family who no matter what they eat can never seem to put on any kind of weight it can also work their way around too right no matter what the person does they all seem to kind of put on some kind of weight so I think there is kind of that such a section of people out there who have kind of been forgotten in the in the in the kind of rush to accept of clinically obese people or people that are really kind of you know walking around in mobility stro strollers and stuff or whatever they may be called and having to take baths in massive tubs outside in their garden because they can't fit into a shower. We've been so quick to kind of accept that kind of person that we've kind of forgot about the middle ground and these girls maybe represent the middle ground. Anyway, there was, a t there was a bit of the video that kind of really, that really kind of annoyed me a little bit that I'm going to play for you guys and hopefully I'll speak about it in a respectful and honest manner because again, I've come from the place because I also was somebody that had, you know, that had a lot of excess weight and was able to lose it over a long period of time. So I know what the psyche of that person is like and I know what that kind of self-talk does to you in your head and I know what it can kind of convince you of. Um... And the kind of damage you can do in the long run. So anyway, let's play the video and hear what that's to say. So it says here yeah, the, the an annotation here: yeah, two plus size model inspired body confidence. I'm a, I'm a plus size yeah. model, and I really wanted to show that it's um you know women of all shapes and sizes can can do it, and you know you yeah. can feel comfortable comfortable and confident it, in your own body. Some people may ask if you're capable of of running these serious runs, which are impressive. Do you lose weight? I mean, that might not be your goal, yeah. but it, it, you're obviously able to do this and you're physically mm -hmm. capable, which loads of people aren't. What would you say to that? I mean, I personally would say that I am a very active um, person. I exercise three or four times a week and I eat a really balanced diet, but I'm still a plus size model. So, um, that's interesting, right? Because you'd have to, again, you're going to have to take her word for it. She says she exercises three times, three to four times a week and she eats a balanced diet. Now, exercising three or four times a week, what does that actually mean, right? What exercises are you doing? How much are you pushing yourselves? Um, um, what's the level of intensity? Your, your heart rate, all that sort of stuff needs to be included because I think, I don't know, from the work that I've done and from how I've kind of gone about to losing my weight, because again, I used to be 265 pounds 
I don't know what, how many stones that is. It might be 16 stone or whatever it may be, right? Um, let me actually check that out here. Um, units measure. This is, how, this is how big I used to be, right? Let's see if I can find it here. Da, 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 da. Ba, 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 ba. Weight. Um, go to pounds and then go to stone here, right? Let's see if I can get stone there. Okay, cool. I used to be 265 pounds. So I was 18 stone, right? Let's say about 17 to 18 stone. And then I got down to now about 15 stone. But I got down to my max I got down to was 12 stone or 13 stone. I got down to 13 stone from being 18 stone, right? So I lost five stones in the process of like, I don't know, six months or something like that, right? And again, I don't think, and I think that was all due to running. Because again, I wasn't going to gym as regularly as I am nowadays. I go to gym probably more than I run. Um, but I was running, I think, nearly every single day. Because I was going by the regular program that you'd get on the, on the website. You know that couch, it's a 5K, those kind of programs that basically tell you to run all the time. And then, as soon as, you know, the more comfortable I got with training, the more experience I got with other sorts of bits of exercise, I said, I decided to do stuff, stuff like power speed endurance, um, like CrossFit endurance that kind of promoted this idea where you don't need to run every single day long distance. You could kind of change it up and do short distances. You could do tempo work. You could do uh, laps. You could do whatever it may be called, right? So I didn't necessarily need to keep doing my mileages, but back then I was doing a mileage kind of workout every single day, apart from maybe a Sunday where you have a kind of a rest day, so so to speak. And I would have to say at that weight, considering that you're not really skinny, because I think when you're big, you tend to lose a lot of weight, even if you're not eating well, because you just, you know, the body just can't hold on to that much excess weight. It just kind of just falls off of you. And then over time, you reach a bit of a plateau where you then need to really get strict your diet in order to kind of lose the other kind of niggly little 20 pounds extra, right? Same, same like me at the moment, right? I'm 220. But in order for me to lose that next 20, I really need to be strict on my diet, not cheat at all, work out all the time, sleep a ton, sleep eight hours, essentially, essentially a, a day, and I'll be fine. But I just find it very difficult to believe that you can eat a balanced diet. I don't, and again, I don't even know what a balanced diet means. What does she mean by a balanced diet? Does that, does that mean having a cup of, a glass of orange juice, a bowl of cereal with some milk, um, I don't know, a coffee with milk and sugar, um, bread with avocado, like what does that actually mean a balanced diet? Because if it's all those things, then it probably isn't the best diet for you to lose weight with, right? Um, but again, that might not be her intention. She might not be. She might be perfectly fine with just looking the way she does and just being trim, right? Because because that's the thing as well. Also, that I think maybe is maybe get lost in the conversation. Like you can put, it is possible to be a bigger person, but also be look fit, right? Look like you work out. You don't need to look. You you don't need to look like you're losing weight. For you to look like you work out, you don't need to look like you're, you have no fat for you to look like you're healthy and fit. And I think that's the problem that probably have people have with these sort of kind of conversations. Um, and again, I've, I, don't, I don't know, I don't know what the conver- I don't know what the real truth of it is, but I'm not sure if this is kind of being completely one hundred percent honest. But again, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm wrong. But let's let the video continue. And I'm a size, a solid size, sixteen to eighteen. And have you always so, been? Since and I you were younger. I, when I trained um, as a dancer, I used to be on a very, very strict diet and I was a lot smaller, but it was so tough for me to stay that size. Because it, was it wasn't your natural. It wasn't my natural yeah. body. So it's actually, for me to stay a, a solid size 16 to 18, I eat a regular amount of food and I exercise three to four times a week. Yeah. But I don't know what your regular, again, it, it maybe goes back to the saying, uh, what people are saying now with the UFC and MMA, right? Um, they want to include more weight divisions so that people don't have to go on extreme weight cuts in order to kind of, you know, fight which kind of makes a lot of sense. But I guess with the UFC, you don't want to have too many weight classes. It might confuse it. It might dilute the product. People might not care as much, blah, blah, blah. And essentially, if you have all the best people fighting at a particular kind of weight class, it makes that weight class very, it makes that, that weight class a lot more stacked, right? A lot more um, a lot more exciting for fans to kind of keep an eye on the rankings, that sort of shit. But I don't know if there's, um, hmm. maybe she's right. Maybe there is such a thing as a walking weight. That is just the way you, you're, if, if you can just eat a balanced, if you can eat relatively healthy for five days, again, what relatively healthy mean though? That's a problem, isn't it? If you can eat a, a healthy diet, right? A keto, paleo, um, slow carb diet, or even just a vegan diet for five days a week, vegetarian or whatever it may be, and be strict for those Monday to Friday and then kind of fuck off for two days a week or maybe one day a week. Is it possible that you're going to stay the same size? It's probably impossible, right? Especially if you work out as intense as you say you do. I would think so. Anyway, let's continue. 
and I stay this size. So, um, you know, I think, yes, I guess if you are training intensely, naturally you will lose weight. Mm. But I think if, if you have a normal moderate life, you know, I eat in moderation, I exercise in moderation and for me and running running the marathon we trained a lot and like one of our longest um, runs was a 23 mile run through london and i didn't lose any weight whilst i was training in fact i put on weight because your muscle starts to get heavier <laughs> come on man come on come on man this is where i think they lost me i think i honestly think anyone that's run a lot outside i think i've mentioned it all the time here on this podcast that running is much more difficult than any other kind of physical activity that I've done, whether it's, you know, going to a gym or whatever it may be. It may be outside of maybe playing football. Running is insanely difficult. The things that does to your mind the night before, you wake up in the morning, you just don't want to go. Like, I've, I've kind of had doubts about going to the gym in the morning, but I've always kind of powered through. But I generally have not gone to run in the morning because I just haven't been up to it. My mind's told me, no, don't do it. You're too tired, sleep. It's, I generally done that. And, that. and again, the people who know me know that I have quite good willpower. When I want to stop something, if I if I say I want to stop drinking, stop taking whatever, um, stop going out, stop whatever, I can do it for long periods of time with no with no hassle whatsoever. I don't need any kind of encouragement to do that. I just do it at the drop of a hat, which is kind of what I'm going to do now, especially um, post whatever happened to me over the weekend. Um, but there is a part of me that's like I just can't understand how it's possible to run as much as they're saying they run for a marathon and not lose any weight it's literally impossible unless you're just not eating well the whole time like you're just eating exactly what you've been eating previously and you're trying to run which is really um counterintuitive and really strainful and really um uh, strenuous to your body overall like i've I, I know what it's like to run at 265 pounds and also know what it's like to run when you're 220 i also know what it's like to run when you're uh 200 pounds and it's a completely complete it's night and day how easy, how much easier it is to run around um, without that much weight, without that much extra weight carrying around you, without you carrying that much extra weight. And I just think the idea that you can run that much and it kind of builds up your muscle and makes it more heavy is just bizarre. It's like, no, that's not the case. Like your muscles are developing, are getting stronger, are getting more toned and defined underneath the layers of fat as you're running. But then your diet is not allowing that fat to get stripped away so you can see all your muscles and stuff. That's basically what's happening with this young lady. And I don't know. And again, I, I don't know. Maybe there is biologically you can be made up in a certain way that you're unable to lose weight through cardio. Maybe there's something in that. Um, but I just doubt it. I just don't think it's possible. Like I've never heard of anybody like it just doesn't make any sense. Like every trainer that trains any kind of professional person, whether it be a boxer or a fighter, or whatever it may be, knows the easy way for someone to lose weight is just to run a lot. Loads of cardio, tons and tons of cardio, elliptical, rowing machine, whatever it may be sweating your ass off, um, limiting the amount of calories, you will lose weight, like nine times out of 10. And I just don't think it's, um, I just don't think it's productive. I just don't think it's beneficial for somebody like, first for these young ladies who are obviously promoting something really incredible and something super awesome to be promoting this idea that just because you, if you run a lot, you're not going to lose weight. I don't think that's true. I think what they should be promoting, again, no, it's not my place to tell them what they should and shouldn't be doing, but what I would prefer to hear um would be these girls talking about you know how in the conversation of you know of people accepting clinically obese people or people that you know that are way 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 off the scale um we have forgotten about the need for people to kind of support and help people or help women especially who are maybe a little bit more um curvy in the truest sense of the term not curvy in terms of just you know incredibly fat but curvy in terms of like they have are incredibly much more curvy than other women they may have bigger hips bigger bums bigger thighs bigger legs bigger boobs bigger shoulders whatever it may be called right um um it's important that these women know that no matter how much they work out they're never going to end up looking like kate moss right that's one thing right you're not going to look like kate moss you might look like a version a better version of yourself but you won't look like that because she's built a certain way and I think it's important for those women to know that, hey, you can also train and just make whatever you have look better, right? You can tone that up. You can look like an Amazonian woman, an Amazonian princess, right? I think of somebody like an Amber Rose, right? Who's, you know, who's built like, again, but she's not that tall. But anyway, that's not a good example. But uh, Serena Williams, very, very good, good example, right? A very, di she's built differently than Natalia, N N N N Natal Natalia, Natalia, What's her, what's her name? Natalia Natarova, Natarova, whatever her name is. Anyway, she's built in. She's built differently than the that um Japanese girl that she faced, right? Who beat her recently, the young girl. That she's built differently than these women. 
So it's it's impossible to kind of you would never tell. I don't know. Name whatever. Um, name whatever tennis player that's female that isn't Serena Williams. You'd never. You'd never entertain the idea if they came around to you and told you, "Oh, I'm trying to put on twenty pounds of muscle so I can look like Serena Williams." It wouldn't make any sense, right? Yeah, that's not going to work, though. You're not going to look like her. You might put on twenty pounds of muscle, but you won't look like her. Like she built a different way than you. And I think that's a message that needs to be promoted. But to promote the idea that you can do cardio and not lose weight and build muscle, it's just bizarre to say the least. But anyway, let's let it continue again. Uh, and so you can take and you consume more food because you're hungry yeah. and you need to fuel and even if you're fueling with all the right food you still bulk up i found mm. no you don't that's not true it's not true it's not true you can't fuel up with the right food bulk up and not lose weight it's just literally impossible it goes against any kind of dietary um advice you'd hear from anyone in in the industry it goes against any, anything those guys would say right it doesn't because if that if that was the case then how would people lose weight like, how would they do it if that was the case? Like, what, would they have to starve themselves? That's not true, because people don't starve themselves. People sometimes eat more good calories, right? More of the good stuff they have they probably than they would eat uh, previously because they're working out and they're having to refuel themselves, as that girl said. But they're also losing weight. I just think it's very, very dangerous to go around saying these kind of things to people. I think it just does more harm than good to their cause overall, because I think what they're doing, like I said, is great. Promoting this idea of body positivity in the truest form of this, in the truest form of the phrase, right? Like women out there should realize that they're not always going to look like Kate Moss or like Cheryl Cole or whoever maybe else in the industry. They're going to look like the way they're going to look like, right? They have to make the best of what they have in their arsenal and their availability. But to, to somehow say you can work out incredibly hard, eat the right foods, and still not lose, and still lose weight. That's really, that's a very very bad message to send out. I think in my experience. It's cold as well when you're doing that. Oh, this is what we are concerned about it, because <laughs> genuinely nip it, and that will hopefully make me run a little bit Fun faster. Intended. <laughs> Fun definitely. We intended. actually have excellent sports bras, so I don't think we'll have any. It won't be too nippy. I mean, embrace us, your body. You know, you know, pretty, um, pretty. Do you train in your underwear? You're only going to do this run in the That's underwear. A good question. I mean, when we, we trained for the marathon, we did one training day in our underwear, but we were lucky enough to be in Ibiza. <laughs> this time around, I don't know if the, <laughs> streets, I do it. I don't know if the streets of London are really ready for our training is. day. Oh, man, I don't know, man. Again, it's, it's strange. I think I was talking to somebody else, else about this. Um, anyway, good luck to the girls, isn't it? Um, I hope, hope they do well in a run and, you know, good luck to them. But, stuff. but I think I was talking to somebody else about this, I think. I forgot who I was talking to. Uh, who was I talking to? Who was I talking to? I forgot. I was talking to somebody, I think maybe in the party the other day. And I think I mentioned something along the lines of, you know, and I think it's a bit sad when I see these kind of things because, you know, essentially... The only people that they're talking to, these young ladies, are other young ladies, right? Yeah, other young ladies are the ones that are a bit more, are the harshest to other young ladies. I don't think dudes care for the most part. I think there's always going to be a portion of dudes out there who are going to be quick to kind of snipe at and kind of point at girls who are, don't look the way that they want them to look in some ways. But, you know, those are dweebs you should never listen to in the first place. But I think for the most part, there's a big portion of dudes out there who kind of like a girl that's a little bit you know that has a bit more meat on the bone that they're kind of into girls that look like that right they don't necessarily want all the girls in the world to look one way right in the same way that not all girls want all guys to look one way right there's some girls that don't like guys that are like overly muscular some of it has to do with the fact that they probably won't be able to get any kind of they, they, they probably haven't had experience of being with a guy that's incredibly fit anyway so why would you lust after something you can't necessarily get or isn't in your own disposable I don't know what it is but there are loads of portion of girls out there that don't really care about what a guy looks like physically some of the reasons why a guy goes to gyms is potentially just to impress other dudes right it's not necessarily to impress girls there are portion of girls that will be impressed by it but for the most part you know you're kind of doing it just to impress your mates so they can say you've got big guns and all that malarkey but it makes me sad because sometimes I think to myself like I just think in general compared in the sexes i just think women seem to be a little bit more delusional than guys do they seem to have to sell themselves they seem to have to convince themselves of things that not no one else believes right in terms of this one right like, oh unless i if i run a lot i don't tend to lose weight i just build muscle it doesn't really do anything blah blah, blah. it's like who are you really convincing here you really have to convince yourself because we all know it's not true right and i just think that delusion is maybe some of the is one of the things that just makes me sad i just i don't know you'd hope that Especially nowadays, considering, you know, the acceptance we have across the board of people's religious views, um, uh, sexual orientations, whatever, maybe interest. You just hope that some of these people would be a little bit less, 
would care a lot less about what people think about them in general and would kind of just, you know, keep their eye on the prize, speak to the people that they want to speak to, promote the things that they want to promote, and that's it. But this over, um, this need to try and to convince the entire public that this is how things should be or trying to convince the public, the, the public about what they, about weight loss and that sort of stuff when we know the truth isn't the right way to go about things because we know we can call out your bluff we don't want to because you don't want to be mean but we know this is bullshit you know what i mean so that's the thing that kind of makes me sad sometimes when i read these sort of topics but again i think everyone's got their everyone's got their right to kind of do what they want and i'm hoping maybe over time that this might be actually a thing that kind of helps them out in the future going forward but anyway um that's it for me i don't want to rabbit on too much about girls trying to lose weight because again it's not my business not my concern um this has been the Zinger zinga show episode number one eight Three, I think a two or something. I forgot which one it was, but hey, you saw it. You heard it at the start of the big show. Um, as always, find out more about myself, AgostinoZinger.com. That's all the details regarding myself and what I'm up to. Um, I'll be DJing again this Friday at Tap East and maybe a few other places on the weekend. Dates to be announced. I'll announce those and list them up on my website so everyone can see and they'll be up on Resident Advisor and all that malarkey. Um, until then, for those of you watching through YouTube, give me a like, give me a subscribe. For those of you listening through the podcast app, I would appreciate a review. That would be awesome. Let people know what you think of the show so that it shows up on people's searches and all that malarkey. And I'll see you guys again very soon for another episode of the show. Until then, take care, my friends.